I know you were in grad school and you were getting on Twitter. Uh, what was happening in your life as all of this began to unfold? Yeah, gosh, it seems like yesterday that it was back in 2010. I was um, basically in my doctoral program at the University of Tennessee in Knoxville. Um, I was basically in the midst of dissertation work and social media at that time, I really was very passionate about. I knew that this was a key area that I wanted to be in. And ultimately um, I would say that the, the time that I was at a doctoral student, like there was still a lot of uncertainty around like, if this is a real thing, is it a fad? I was told that I should study something that actually would be longstanding, that I would be able to get jobs in. And um, there was a lot of, uh, you know, concern about how long social media was going to be around and whether or not it would actually be a key area in public relations. And so I'm happy to say 10 years later, I'm glad that I stuck to my guns. And um, but I would say, yeah, in 2010, it was still like, I mean, it's still wild, wild west right now in terms of practices and stuff, but more so back in the day in 2020, 2010. And Gina Luttrell from, and now Gina Luttrell from Syracuse has joined us as a presenter. Welcome to Omaha 2020, Gina. Hi, welcome, thank you. I think what's interesting about the discussion we're about to have is that both you and Karen, you know, developed as scholars during this, this period that everybody's been talking about this morning, where there was rapid technological and social change. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. Um, you know, I think just building off of some of what Karen had expressed a moment ago, um, around the same time, if I look back to 2010, I was in my PhD studies too, and I was thinking about topics for my dissertation, and I ended up landing on how students can use social media to learn. So Twitter, Facebook, and WordPress, and, um, you know, I, it was, it was different. And, you know, the committee was like, I don't know if you should be doing this. This, <laughs> this is so new, it might not be around. And in the back of my mind, I was always like, what do you mean? This is like cutting edge. This is the next evolution of where communications is heading. And so, you know, I think that both Karen and I really came into this field at such a prime time because um, we were able to pave the way in so many different ways in terms of our research, in terms of connecting with professionals, and then bringing that back to the classroom. So I think that we were both fortunate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm so glad that you brought that up, Gina, in terms of like bringing it back to the classroom. And that was even too, I mean, I remember it was 2011 that University of Tennessee actually established their first social media class. And that was something that I jumped on immediately. I'm like, I need to get experience, you know, to get, you know, be able to teach this to classes. And even then, you know, there were only a few classes in various universities that were offering social media as a course. And even still today, I mean, I've had professionals that are like, really, you guys actually have classes then? I'm like, no, we actually have programs, majors, minors. And yeah, even then the teaching practices, how do you incorporate the theory, research and practice of social was still really um, undiscovered territory. And so yeah. I'm glad that I we had- The first class that I ever created in social media was called Online Public Relations and Advertising. It didn't even have social media in it, in the title, because it was so new and it was just, you know, we were really embarking on this area. Mm -hmm. And I think it's interesting, we started to talk about this um, earlier, that the field of public relations has really changed. I think Rick Murray addressed this a little bit this morning that, um, you know, the, the old style PR media relations, getting your clients in the newspaper, that kind of model, it's still out there, but it, it's really fallen uh, a bit behind this, this digital PR environment that we are in now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's been interesting just to kind of see the evolution um, and just the rapid change of pace of how PR has kind of shifted. And I mean, I even look, I mean, during 2010, how um, it was really a big thing at Tennessee where the, um, the social media class was actually housed in advertising, but PR students could take over. So it was one of the classes that was offered that basically all majors could, could take, which you would want to have both sides of the coin, especially in social media. You want to have advertising students be able to help the PR students help, you know, with their work and vice versa. 
And I think that's kind of where we'll be talking a little bit too about like where we're at right now or where we're going. Like you need to have that integrated uh, approach because social is its own department, its own role in many cases, but you have to understand all of the pieces of the puzzle. You need to understand the pay media side. You need to understand the relationships, community building, but then you also have to kind of look at the bigger picture. How do we tie our business objectives to what we do on social to provide return on investment? You know, and so everything is inter- integrated, you know, within social. For those yeah, who, I, who don't know it uh, quickly, Karen uh, was one of the founders of a social media professors group on Facebook what about two a little bit over two years ago maybe uh, and you have four four actually, time flies yeah in six <laughs> days it'll actually be four yeah four years and so i'll make sure to share the link to the group um because i i feel like that's a, a great way to kind of um build community where you have uh professors from all over the world who teach social who do research you have practitioners and so um so i i really appreciate um the shout out, Jeremy, you've been a great member and con- contributor. And so it's been a great community. So I just shared the link within um, the chat. So the more the merrier, if anyone would like to join, just feel free to join. And when you started it, did you ever imagine it would grow to nearly 2000 members now? No, <laughs> I, I was I was shocked and it. You know what? It's interesting, it, you know, like this idea came from a research study because I actually had another professor, another PR professor. I want to give a shout out to Chris Wil- Wilson at BYU because I talked to him and he was the one he said, I wish there was a place where social media professors could come together because he felt like there really wasn't a space dedicated to us. And so then the little light bulb came up. I'm like, well, yeah, we, we need to do that. So um, yeah, the Facebook group came about, but yeah, it's almost to 2000 members. And we have representatives from Facebook, Twitter, um, Snapchat, uh, all of the major kind of tech organizations and brands that um, are part of our community there. And so we can have a conversation and bounce around ideas. So it's been really rewarding. And I think the timing was ideal because it hit just as Facebook was really emphasizing groups. Yes. And that leads me to to Gina and my question, which is, you know, we've lived in a world of siloed academic fields. And it seems to me that one of the lessons of the Facebook group and some of the research programs that people are developing is that, that there is a disruption happening. Yeah, for sure. I mean, you know, a moment ago, you talked about the fact that public relations moved beyond media relations. Well, I would argue that we've always moved beyond media relations. It's just that our field has been so pigeonholed into always being that one thing, working with journalists. Um, you know, I, I, there's this great quote from um, Edward Bernays, um, and I always show it to my students because it talks about the different abilities and skills that a practitioner needed back in 1942. And when I throw it up there, I don't tell them that. And I say, you know, our, you know, the, where do you think this came from? And most of them think that it came from a job description because we're still looking for those skills. We're looking for them in a different way though. We, every, you know, one of us, whether we are in advertising, marketing, or public relations in those those traditional siloed areas of academics are working in paid, earned, shared, and owned. We may teach these items through a very uh, a slightly different lens, but at the end of the day, we are all connecting. And if you look at any of the major um, agencies, all of them are using paid, earned, shared, and owned, and they have this very converged approach. So what we see in the field, I feel as though academics has to sort of catch up to that. Um, we're a little bit behind. You know, to, we, there are. Um, far and few between academic institutions that really do have dedicated social media majors and minors and certificates and tracks. Um, When we look at curriculum and you trace it, it's social media throughout a curriculum. Um, But if you look at industry, you often see a director of social media um, and there are entire um, offices and teams and groups that are dedicated to this type of, of work. And so I think we need to connect industry and academics a little bit more. Yeah, and I think when we think of the three primary roles of academics, teacher, researcher, service slash community engagement, 
for me, I felt like social was an opportunity to integrate them all. And to, and I think Karen, you started to get into this, how, you know, the teaching and the, 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 you know, the online action has fed into your research program. Oh, absolutely. And I, I mean, I was like with Gina, you know, when I was working on my doctoral program, my dissertation actually, I mean, was social media and crisis communication, because I saw that there's a big gap between how to help brands and businesses not get themselves into a crisis on social media. <laughs> uh, so I thought, oh, okay, this could be an interesting thing, you know, to kind of explore. But it wasn't really until I started teaching that um, I actually had a few people you know, I, I've always been passionate about teaching and really kind of, as Gina said, like building a bridge between academia and industry. I felt like that has been one of the things that I think is missing, especially in our field. And I remember when I started teaching at the University of Louisville, and I was actually hired on uh, to teach and create a social media class and also so social media specialization there. Um, but I had one friend that said, well, Karen, why aren't you doing teaching research and see whether or not what you're doing in the classroom is working? I'm like, Okay, so I kind of fell into that, but I was hesitant just because in my doctoral program in 2010, not only was I doing wanting to go and do research in this fad of social media, but teaching research is still um, looked upon as not as rigorous and you know um, applicable than regular research um, that we see in our field, which I, I absolutely disagree with because we're seeing kind of what's going on with COVID. And I, I feel that um, being able to balance all of those different elements, like if the research you do in social can lead to teaching, but also could lead to not only just a service, but professional opportunities. I've been able to get some consulting projects and connect with people based on what I'm doing with my teaching and research, where I think the modern professor definition allows us to kind of expand where we're able to kind of enhance our personal branding, uh, possibly becoming more of an entrepreneur, you know, and it's a side hustle and kind of like our role is kind of shifting along with the changes that we're seeing in social and digital. Yeah, I agree with that completely because, um, you know, I, I often talk to my students about, you know, journalists having to have all of these different areas, like you're no longer just writing, you know, going out and writing your story, but you have to maintain a social presence and you have to connect with your community. And I feel as though professors today have to do that same thing. Yes, you are doing your research. Yes, you're teaching. Yes, there's your service. But woven throughout all of that is your presence on social media, literally, whether it's your Twitter feed, your LinkedIn or wherever, but also within your classroom and within your research endeavors. So it's just sort of seamless in my mind. Yeah, and I think you're, you're touching both on a, on a very important issue, which is Karen, you went through the tenure process uh, not that long ago. Gina's just going through it. Uh, and, you know, there is the pedagogical research er, at question, question, which, you know, the 35 years that I've been doing this, this always comes up on these personnel mm -hmm. uh, RPT committees. But I do think the field has improved. I know a shout out to our editor at Journalism and MassCom educator, Jamie Fullerton, who has really worked hard to, um, you know, sort of tighten the acceptance the peer mm -hmm. review process and previous editors have done that as well to be able to argue for the value, uh, the rigor of that, that type of research. But I do think some of what you're touching on too goes to the issue of um, creative activity, other forms of you know, being a public intellectual on social media as you are. Uh, you know, how do you sort of quantify that? Yeah, I'm really glad that you brought that up, Jeremy, because I know when I would did my pre-tenure review, which was 2013-14, I had to explain what Hootsuite was and why working with them was so important. I mean, I, I had to kind of realize that my package was being reviewed by individuals who were not in my field. So I really had to kind of walk through to kind of show this significance. But I'm glad that you brought up ROI. Because I am a big believer of brand partnerships. Um, you know, just I think that's a role that I think as professors, I think it is important for us to kind of look at what are some of the brand partnerships we can create, not just for our classes, but our programs in university. And what I've been able to do, um, case and example at the University of, of Louisville, last year I was able to serve as a subject matter expert for Facebook Blueprints certification program. But because I was able to build a relationship there. They became a class client last fall. And then fast forward to this year, 
the, you know, Facebook reached out to Louisville saying, you know what, you have this professor here who's doing some really cool things. We actually want to work with you to be a pilot school to be part of our Facebook campus initiative. And so then now Louisville is part of this pilot program with only 30 universities. But like, if you were able to kind of link back, you know, to, you know, kind of, I guess the ROI, they could say, oh, like the first, you know, kind of introduction that we had Facebook really kind of as a kind of a partner at the school was this course. So I think if you're like trying to provide value back to your university, you know, to kind of showing kind of, you know, the metrics, the ROI, like what, where are your students getting jobs? Um, what's your brand exposure? What is the impact, you know, in terms of recruiting? Are you getting students who want to come into your major? There's a lot of measurement components. We, we all teach this in social and PR and stratcom. And I would imagine that Gina would agree with me. It's about kind of reframing saying, well, how can we apply these same principles to what we do as professors in our work and our research and our teaching? So it all comes full circle. Yeah, it really does. You know, um, in the same way that you have your um, industry uh, connections, I do the same thing right now. I'm working with Hootsuite to revamp their, their certification program. And I work closely with Ginny Dietrich at Armit Dietrich and Spin Sucks to create a PISO model certificate for students. So, um, but, but all of that then connects back to the classroom and back to research and, and all of those different areas. So, you know, personally, I think it's exciting to be a, a professor of social media because we are constantly changing. I get to take my syllabus every semester and well, maybe somebody thinks that's daunting, I don't because um, I have my finger on the pulse of what's happening and then we can prepare our students for the future of communications and public relations and social media. Mm -hmm. I agree, Gina. Like, I love the fact that it's constantly changing. And I tell my students right up, like, if I had to do the same thing over and over again, <laughs> I, I have a very small attention span. And so I love the fact that it's constantly changing. I do wish that Mark Zuckerberg and some of these CEOs would kind of pause on some of these updates a little bit. So we don't have to be like, oh, well, bad update. Okay, revamp, you know, in terms of our syllabus and assignments. But I, I do feel that it is an exciting field. And I love the fact that we are able to expand beyond the classroom into these partnerships and getting access. I mean, Hootsuite is a great company and their certifications are, have always been top notch. And I feel that's something that's really wonderful about our field. But I do think what's reassuring, like back again, 2010, 2011, those partnerships may not necessarily have been as valuable, but we're seeing universities kind of looking at these creative activities and these collaborations. They're like, okay, these are going to be things we're going to be evaluating people on, you know, for tenure and promotion. I mean, I know that's what at U of L, our new president has a marketing background, which I'm very grateful for. <laughs> he basically says, yeah, we're, we want you to get into the publications that to kind of talk about your research. We want you to create these brand partnerships. So for me, it's like a dream come true. And so I think we're kind of seeing like the role kind of moving forward to 2020 to now 2030, we're just going to see essentially this role, you know, reversal, we're going to see more appreciation investment, but also more responsibilities attributed to those who want to practice research and teach social. I agree that, you know, campuses are changing. I mean, here at UNO, uh, in the last few years, we've had a medical humanities initiative where faculty in our school are collaborating with faculty at the medical center. Um, the university has a big initiative right now with the Union Pacific to offer instruction to employees. So I think, you know, it's changed a lot in, in the sense that, I mean, a metropolitan university like ours has always been, I think, a, you know, fairly engaged in the community, but I think those relationships are going deeper. I did want to ask you a question uh, from the text. Uh, Ellie is asking about how these programs, these classes are gonna be changing over the next five to 10 years, what, what you imagine at your campuses. So um, we just went through um, examining our graduate and undergraduate program and specifically having to do with social media. A lot of what we see right now are skills-based, how to do something, how to create a blog, how to maintain a Twitter feed, how to you know, um, uh, Instagram. What I think that you're gonna to start to see are more of some of these philosophical, like social media's um, impact on society. You know, I know in the last session, I caught the last half of it and, and um, some, one of the speakers was talking about uh, the new Netflix series. 
Well, those are some of the things that we need to start talking to our students about. Those, the implications of, of um, artificial intelligence, of virtual reality, of all of these different pieces. And so right now there are some um, iterations of that because again, like I said, it's very skills-based and, and um, skills acquisition to prepare you. But also we need to have our students start to think critically about these social media habits. Um, that's one projection, I think, in the next five to 10 years. And the other is I would like us to catch up to industry. And I'd like to see more universities um, have uh, full majors and departments um, within schools dedicated to social media efforts. So just like you have an advertising and public relations program, you should have a social media program. Um, I think the issue has been and the pushback has been, well, we all do this, so it needs to be everywhere. Well, if you're forward thinking and you look at what the industry is doing, then take a step back and say, well, we need to have a major and we need to have a program centered on this. Mm -hmm. Tina, can that feed both into basic and applied research agendas? Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think it depends on, on your areas of interest. I, I try very hard to never put myself in one little box to say, this is what I research. These are my passions. And this is, you know, um, from, you know, journal articles to books to presentations, I try to always just have my overarching areas that I like to look at. Um, but, but I, I don't think any, any of us, especially in social media, really should confine ourselves to, to one area. I 100% agree with Eugenia, like on the box, like I tell my students never, like in social, if someone puts you in a box, take a sledgehammer and just destroy yeah. it. Like just don't even, there is no box, there is no spoon to kind of quote from the matrix. That analogy is getting a little old. My students are like, well, what was that from? I'm like, oh my gosh, okay, pop culture, <laughs> pop culture homework, watch the matrix. But yeah, I, I agree with you absolutely on, you know, the shift between kind of like tactical to kind of like bigger questions. I think that is something where I've actually, we are in the process at Louisville, like um, every school I know has kind of like a grand challenge that they're kind of uh, like kind of having on board. And actually one of ours is kind of like the future of work and kind of looking at digital transformation. So already like what we're actually proposing is making social media part of gen ed. Like, oh, I love that. That's every, great. Yeah. yeah. Every, class which because you know what with like social media we have a social media class in marketing we have one that i teach in the department of communication and then we also have computer science but then at the end of the day you're like well every student needs to have this information it's not just one's you know area of society everyone needs to know this and so it's becoming an essential skill and so i feel that um there's been some companies and brands that have really kind of led that charge in terms of not only digital literacy like adobe has done but you're seeing some of the other brands and industry kind of push saying, hey, we need you know, professionals entering this field that um, have these skills. And we need a lot of people to have these skills. So they need to have more students. And so I, I, that's been something we're pushing. But I agree with you in terms of like tying more with industry. Um, I feel that it's definitely from where it was in 2010, where it was like knocking on doors saying, hey, you know, I'm teaching social. The industry was kind of like, well, we're kind of doing our own thing. I have seen a huge shift, you know, with industry um, collaborations and companies that want to talk to professors, which I'm elated about. I'm just so happy that this is happening where they want to work with us because they're like, yeah, but, but they, the issue that we're still having is they don't know that professors and classes and programs exist. They're like, really? You guys are there? And so, um, Jeremy, as you mentioned with the social media professors group, that's what I've been doing. Like, hey, you need to talk to people. Like if you're in LA, these are the schools that have professors and researchers and teaching social media classes. Or if you're in New York, you're going to talk to Gina. If you're in Nebraska, you're going to talk to Jeremy. And so it's about bringing more awareness forward. So I think that is something that I would make a call like for programs five to 10 years from now. As professors, as programs, as universities, we have to let people know what we're doing because I would say the biggest challenge that we have right now and kind of, I would say in the next few years is the value of higher education because we've seen, oh yeah, you can look at a few YouTube videos and get all the you know insights you need about working in social. We have to provide what value experiences and knowledge that students will be able to walk away with to be marketable. And so that's the challenge that I think programs are gonna have to do as well in cultivating this new trend. 
Yeah, it would seem there's sort of a media literacy component, much in the way we talk about P12 or P16 education and states not really building in enough literacy into uh, the curriculum, you know, the beyond the reading, writing, and arithmetic. Uh, you know, students are media consumers, and yet they are not always taught if they're not, not in a communication program to uh, deconstruct media messages. Uh, I wanted to talk briefly about gender as a, as a research issue, because if you heard any of the last panel, it made me think a lot about uh, different voices in social media. And I, I sometimes wonder, you know, during that age, the last 10 years of social media influencers, where we had fashion influencers and beauty influencers, often women, um, that, you know, when you talk about Karen putting people in boxes, uh, it made me think about that because, you know, just as uh, sometimes women TV reporters have complained, I'm just getting the soft feature stories. Um, th those boxes sometimes are, are framed, that, that framing and narrative. Yeah. Um, what can research teach us as this applies to social media? Yeah, I, I think that's a great question because I do feel that it's very interesting where social media is so open, but a lot, like people like to put people in boxes, right? And I think that's unfortunate because I feel that everyone has unique qualities and you may assume, you know, that these people belong in this category, but I feel like, as Gina said, like these are passion areas, like you want to kind of be ebb and flow, but some people kind of put you either in an age cohort or an industry cohort or even a role cohort. And I think what research tells us is that social media is ever flowing and ever evolving. The technology platforms evolve. So why don't influencers and people evolve as well? Like I, I know as a professor, I am not the same professor where I was when I first started teaching. Like you gain experience, you gain knowledge, you gain, you know, um, time on the platforms, cultivating relationships, cultivating communities. And I would say too, the, the one box that I felt like that I've probably have been trying to break down like ever since I've gotten into academia is the box that industry sometimes puts academics or other people who do not think that we are preparing our students for the real world in our social media classes or doing effective research. And that's not true. Like there are so many talented, I mean, even in this community here at Omaha, uh, Omaha 2020 and beyond, you know, in the social media professors group, there are so many talented people. And so People want to put us in boxes, but I would just, you know, my best advice is if every, if you see people putting you in boxes, don't let them, you know, you know, like don't let them put you in that box and say, here's where I'm at, here's my passion points, here's where I'm going, and I'm not limited to just one thing. I'm like humans don't only do one thing. We have multiple interests, multiple passion areas, multiple communities and relationships and uh, roles as part of our lives. So, yeah, can I just add to that too? Um, this whole gender thing really bothers me because a lot of times when you look back at the tech industry, um, we often see a lot of men in this area. And so one of the things that I deliberately did when I wrote the third edition of my social media book was every chapter opens with um, an innovator. And unless the chapter um, specifically um, was tied to, uh, to a, um, a man in the field, I made sure that the readers could see different women who were innovators in social media because we don't often talk about um, women uh, in this field. And so, you know, one of the ways in which we as educators um, can, can help uh, break down those gender barriers is to illustrate to our students, these are the women, these are the women of color. These are, you know, um, experts in our field that we don't traditionally talk about. Because every time we talk about social media, we're always talking about, you know, Mark Zuckerberg, right? I mean, he's the first person, you know, when I, I talk to my students about the history of social media, they think it goes back to Facebook. And so it, it's beyond just Facebook and he isn't the person that invented social media. So, um, so I think it's, it's our responsibility in the same way that we talk about diversity, equity, and inclusion in our classroom, that we break down those gender barriers that are related to social media as well. I'm glad that you brought that up, Gina, because that was something, um, like I, I have a social media book, but I also wrote a PR book um, that was published this year. That was like a big thing that I wanted to do was to highlight individuals that were diverse, not just in their background, but perspectives and it, it is so important to kind of illustrate that because I can say, you know, like if you do look at the industry, if you look at these keynote speakers or these 
you know, individuals who are always on, these are the top marketing influencers. I mean, they're the same people. They've been the same people for the last like 10 plus years. And my concern is if I was going to present this to my students, right? Who's the next generation? Who are individuals that are kind of like in their kind of age cohort that aren't going to be those individuals that you're going to see, you know, making the shifts, train, you know, doing things creatively that, you know, will help shape the field. And so what I've tried to do is introduce those individuals and find those individuals to bring into my classes. And what's great is that I love the fact, like, especially marketing Twitter, I love marketing Twitter. Like if you guys want to find a community of some really amazing rock stars, like those individuals are literally, I mean, they're behind all of the brands that we talk about, but they're not the ones on stage, right? There's people that talk about them and their work are, but they're not. And I feel for us as academics, we need to bring those individuals who are actually doing the work into our classrooms, talk to them, do research together, share insights and build a collaborative integrated community. And so that's, that's been kind of my, my kind of mission kind of moving forward is to highlight those individuals. Cause again, Gina, as you mentioned, they're much more diverse than yeah. um, the marketing, you know, thought leaders that we've seen. And I'm, you know, I think we need like, like social media, those groups, you know, need to evolve as well. And so I've been trying to advocate those, you know, individuals. I have a question from Todd Murphy at Universal Information Services here in Omaha, um, media monitoring company that monitors, uh, I think has a global reach. Um, and he's asking, I think a good question that uh, I don't know the answer to. At Syracuse and Louisville, uh, are your universities uh, on the tech side involved? Are the academics on, on the, the computer science area, uh, IT? Uh, involved with businesses developing apps? Because his question is, you know, his experience is often that, you know, that happens more in the private sector. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I think that's a great question, Todd. And I would say that at Louisville, like we do have a strong um, have medical health and engineering um, program. And one of the things that we are seeing is we are seeing more collaborative partnerships. So we do have an entrepreneurship program in, um, and computer science program, both at the undergraduate graduate level at Louisville. And so we are seeing that basically teams are coming together to create apps. So students are coming together like for a variety of different, you know, apps and stuff, but mostly um, related to healthcare. Um, but then the other one that we have seen, um, of course, has been uh, betting. You know, um, because in, in Louisville, we like we like bourbon, we like basketball, but we also like horses. And so there's been, um, we actually have a new equine marketing program that launched a few years ago. So um, there have been some apps developed specifically for that industry because right there, you have Churchill Downs, you have all of those um, horse racing entities right there. So they're easy, it's easily accessible, you know, to pitch them and say, oh, here's a new gambling app, or here's something that would be helpful for this aspect of the industry. So there is um, kind of that entrepreneurship tech um, innovative culture, but it is kind of in those uh, specific areas. We're trying to grow that more often. There is going to be kind of more of a universal, similar to social media, like a universal entrepreneurship kind of innovation kind of component that is going to be integrated as part of our um, general ed, which is exciting to see, but that's still kind of like at the early stages. Yeah, and here at, at um, Syracuse, there's a couple of areas where we are, are involved in app development. Um, within Newhouse specifically, we have what's called the Mind Lab, which is um, entrepreneurship and connecting um, faculty and students with um, entrepreneurs in the industry. And then we also have our experimental lab where we're doing quite a bit of research and work with um, industry professionals in, the terms of, in terms of AR, VR, um, and then within Syracuse as a whole, we have our iSchool and they are very much connected to um, some of the big name social media companies and app development um, from Salesforce to Twitter to Facebook. So it's happening. Um, <laughs> um, and maybe that's a lesson that we're talking about here. We need to promote it more, I guess. And I do see that uh, in our audience is Dale Easley from our entrepreneurship program in the business college. And Dale has been at the forefront of trying to get faculty together from different disciplines to basically speak the same language and share ideas. And it's led to the development of uh, courses such as media entrepreneurship. Um, I think the next level is how do these collaborative teams uh, 
partner with businesses and start uh, developing projects around those ideas. Um, speaking of business and the business college, um, let me throw this question out because I think it's, it's one that I've experienced here in Omaha. So 10 years ago, I was just finishing reading Jim Stern's social media metrics book. And the marketing business, uh, the, the developing business of social marketing, I think, was out in front of a lot of folks on, on how to uh, leverage um, these tools and how to measure what was happening. But I think in more recent years, business colleges, marketing programs have uh, kind of caught the fever about social media that mm -hmm. some of us had uh, 10 years ago or more. Uh, what, what's happening on your campuses in terms of collaboration with marketing and business faculty? Yeah, I actually, it's interesting, like with our business school, like literally like there, our building is right across this, like the walkway of our business school. So we're like really close. And what's interesting, I, I, you know, I've actually had more marketing students at the undergrad come over to my classes because they, they do have a social media class over the business school, but what they're getting is part of their feedback from industry is that um, they, they're great with numbers, they're great with market research, which is great, sales, awesome, but they said, you're missing that strategic communication element. You're missing the creativity that is involved in social media. So they basically all like come to my classes, you know, to get that experience. So I would say that when I first started at U of L, like when I wanted to propose my social media class, I couldn't call it just social media because that was the course name for the business school. They were like, that's our name. I'm like, okay, fine. So mine is social media and strategic communications. And then I also added mobile technology. So I'm like, well, that covers AR, VR, you know, everything, you know, so, um, and so it really was a good relationship now where I'm actually, I've been, you know, they're, they're kind of as, you know, talks for doing a dual course, you know, over there with their MBA, you know, because we do have a master's degree over at Louisville um, because, you know, they do have a digital marketing class, but they don't have a social media course that kind of is along the lines of my strategic course. So the relationships as we see right now are really good. And I think we're going to see kind of this bridge program emerge. Um, there's been talks, well, before COVID, there was a talks about doing a bridge program between business and calm. Um, but now, you know, we're kind of getting back into the swing of things, you know, um, after COVID. Um, at Newhouse, most of our students, um, a majority of them are dual majors. So they are a major here at Newhouse somewhere and then also within our business school. So a lot of my public relations students uh, are also a major at uh, Whitman in their marketing program. Um, and many of them choose that because the two complement each other really well. Um, you know, I, to, to Karen's point that the public relations and communication side of things is teaching you about the strategy and the relationship building and things like that. And then in the business school, they get some of the more marketing and um, hard line, bottom line. So they, they complement each other. But this is one of the areas where I think that universities overall can, can do better. Right, because again, if we go back to the industry, marketing, PR, advertising is not separate anymore. We are together. And so finding ways, finding bridges to connect and do more is, um, I think, is, is an important call for, for schools of today. Um, I created a course that, that'll run for the first time next semester called Social Media and Innovation. And that's just about, I think, you know, to your point, um, Karen, the class that you created, it's sort of this all encompassing, like, let's look at where we were and where we're going and how we stay innovative in this field. And so it's open to any student, not just our new house students, um, but anyone can take it. So trying to make those connections with students in other programs in our graduate program. Um, uh, our on-campus graduate program for public relations, our students have um, a three credit elective and they can take that anywhere. And I often encourage them to go to the business school. I often encourage them to go to the iSchool, find another class outside of here um, and stretch yourself. If there's something that interests you at Falk College or wherever, um, take another class in a, in a different area that complements what you wanna know. And I think that relationship is really good. And one thing that I would, you know, also kind of bring up, like, we, like most of them we're talking about, like, you know, undergrads and maybe master's students. Um, I think the other thing I would encourage is PhD students, right? Yeah. You know, I mean, 
Yeah. So I had a minor in business at, uh, at Florida. I took one course, like we didn't have like a minor or specialization at USC. Uh, we were able to take a business call class, but in at Tennessee for my doctoral program, I had my primary area in PR, but I had to do marketing as my outside area and taking marketing classes at the doctoral level is a whole new experience. It was good. I mean, it taught me a lot, but I, I would say like in any PhD program, I would encourage PhD students to sit in a market research quantitative methods class. I mean, they'll probably look at you like, really, you're, you're assigning us to do this? Like, what, what do you do? It's great, you know, but I mean, just getting that theory, you know, and that research at that level too for marketing, you know, because as professors, we're able to bring that into our classes as well, both at the tactical, theoretical research level. And I really think that, I think that message kind of moving forward, like that's one of the things that whenever I ment mentor PhD students, like, yeah, go to marketing, like take their classes. And then they look at me like, Dr. Freeberg, Karen, what are you doing? I'm like, you're, you're going to like me in a few years, not now, but you'll like me in a few years because <laughs> it, it really was, for me, it was a game changer to kind of get that bridge between marketing and PR. That's a great segue into our last few minutes here, which the three of us are co-editing uh, a handbook this year called the Emerald Handbook of Computer Mediated Communication and Social Media. Mm -hmm. So uh, let's talk a little bit briefly about uh, how we envision these chapters uh, authored by uh, professors around the world to help set a re research agenda going forward. Yeah, so um, I'm really honored to be able to work with you, Jeremy and Gina, on this project. I'm, I'm really, I, I'm, I think this will be a great addition to graduate and um, research agendas, you know, and studies. So I will be overseeing the section two um, section. So the, the handbook is broken up into three sections. So Jeremy has the first section, I have the second, and um, Gina has the third. So they're kind of broken up in between theory research, um, then strategies, tactics, kind of areas of specialization, and then you kind of where the social media is going for, you know, for the future with AR, VR, artificial intelligence. So I would encourage like in terms of, you know, the handbook ideas, I really think that this is a great opportunity to kind of set the pace, you know, set like, areas I know in my section, what are the new emerging specializations where research is thriving and coming into fruition? And how, what are the strategies? What are the tactics? What are the case studies that really are kind of sparking that creativity, that innovation, the new perspectives, maybe developing new ideas for theoretical frameworks that could really kind of move not just our theory and research agenda, but practice. And I hope too, you know, not only with established professors in academia around the world, we want to get um, a representative, um, you know, perspective from um, researchers and colleagues from around the world, but I hope that PhD students who want to kind of start setting their research agenda, take part of this, because this would be a great opportunity to kind of introduce to the world, your view, your perspective, and what you're able to see um, social media happening in the world. Yeah, I, I think that I would add to that. It's it's a great opportunity to, um, I think one of the unique selling points of this handbook is that yes, there is theory. Yes, there are methods. Yes, um, we're looking at what has been a consistent and where the future is going, but also it's really a chance to um, highlight some of the um, innovative things that are happening in our industry through case studies. So, you know, if you're a researcher out there and you're like, I don't know, I, I, I've never written a chapter before um, or, or, or I want to and, and, you know, I'm not sure what that's like, um, take a chance and, you know, pull something together because not only are we looking at some of the hardcore types of research, but we're also trying to incorporate case studies that can be applicable in a, in a classroom setting for students, whether it's undergrad all the way through PhD. And I think that that is um, such a strong point in our book because it spans the depth and breadth of any student learning social media um, today. And the first step is, uh, you know, ask us questions if you have yeah, them. Sure. We're taking simply abstracts November 1st, so it's not mm -hmm. a lot of time to pull your idea together, and then we'll give you feedback. And what's great, too. What, 250 words, 500 words? Yeah. <laughs> so very short. Right. Very short. But I think, too, as June, you mentioned, like, case studies are a great way to kind of really kind of explore what's going on. I mean, 
just this week, I mean, that, that's the thing that I love about social is that there's so much going on, you know, that you can talk about and write about and kind of analyze through a various lens. And I think too, the, the great thing about what we're doing here with this handbook, it's not just for communication. It's like, if you're in marketing, go for it. If you're in health comp, go for it. Like we want it to be interdisciplinary where we're able to get these various perspectives. And so um, there's a lot of things to, I, I would say the hardest thing is kind of figuring out what to write about. Cause there's so many cool things that are happening in social to kind of explore and research and be able to apply in a, a chapter. Yeah, I, this this semester I am drowning in law and ethics because every day there are about 10 items that catch my attention yeah. about okay. something that the president has tweeted or something <laughs> that Facebook has blocked. Uh, it's just almost a, a stream of never ending uh, policy. I spent, I have to admit, I had my class earlier today. I spent about 30 minutes with my students because they wanted to talk about ocean spray. They just, you know, first of all, they were surprised that I knew what happened, like what TikTok was. I'm like, guys, you know what? You know what? <laughs> I'm on TikTok. And that just, again, just we're like, whoa, you know, but, you know, I mean, yeah. So there's just so many cases, you know, so kind of the innovative, creative, you know, kind of the new approaches. What I think was interesting is this is a great time now to kind of explore like pre-COVID um, approaches, you know, like. There were certain things that are still applicable right now, but there's a lot, there's so many new cool approaches and cases and that haven't been really written in an academic setting that could be used and integrated and showcased in this handbook for, you know, so that's what I think is really exciting. There was, I thought, a great comment uh, in AEJMC uh, in August at that virtual conference um, where people were talking, I think it was in the law division talking about the people they follow on Twitter or the groups that they're in and Facebook help spark great new research projects. Oh, for sure. I mean, I can't tell you how many times that I have um, connected with somebody on Twitter and we just have a great exchange and then it leads to some sort of project that we might be working on in the future. So, I mean, take advantage of everything that's out there from the social media Facebook group um, to, listen, my philosophy is always ask, right? If there's somebody out there that you're following and you think, boy, we really are aligned on, on so many issues or so many ideas, then just reach out to them. Um, start small and, you know, it might grow into something really big. I agree with that, Gina and Jeremy. I feel that, I mean, social has opened up so many doors. I mean, you can literally connect with everybody, you know, and it could be something where, you know, because you're a professor, I mean, again, that's something to keep in mind too. If you present yourself and be approachable and you reach out to folks, they will come to you. Like, I mean, I'm forever grateful. I mean, Twitter is by far my favorite platform just because, <laughs> I mean, and I've gotten a lot of looks from people who are like pro LinkedIn. I'm like, I like LinkedIn, don't get me wrong. But when you're looking at conversations and ideas and connections professionally, like if I could list like which platform has given me the most, hands down Twitter. Cause you get to connect with people that you never would have imagined, you know, like that you would have ever had a conversation with. And it's like amazing, you know, and with everything that's going on, I feel too, as you said, with whether we don't have established programs or majors, like if you're teaching social and you are like the only person at your school that is doing that, you have a virtual community that you can part and take part in for free, which is awesome, you know, and we can all connect and we're all in this together. We're all here to help each other. That's the ultimate yeah. goal. I, I often see, you know, I used to teach a, a lesson about personal learning networks and, and helping my students understand how you build those. And Twitter for me has been, you know, when I throw up who's in my personal learning network, um, Twitter is always there because I find so many people that I can connect with and it's easy to send them a tweet or a direct message. And then the next thing you know, you're having these really great, rich yeah. conversations. And so, yeah, I, I, that's my favorite too, Karen. <laughs> and what I'll do too is, I don't know, like, I think it would, might be helpful for us to kind of maybe tweet out like using the Omaha 2020 hashtag, like who are kind of like our must follows. Because there's some individuals that, I mean, like the way that they are committed to our students and research and working with academics, like there's some amazing people out there. And, um, and I think it would be great for us to share this with the attendees, you know, just to kind of give these individuals shout outs, like, and you, you'll be happy, you know, to uh, connect and they want to connect with people and they might be in your hometown or city. Yeah. So 
And I and and um, we also created an infographic too. That I think that Karen's going to share um, about some of our predictions of where we were and in 2010, where we are now in 2020, and where our field is heading in 2030 as well. Yeah, and I, I think I actually did just share that a few minutes ago um, with the infographic. But yeah, I'd love to hear from the attendees, like if you, you know, what else you kind of see. Because I really feel that that's, I mean, when we kind of look at social media, everyone kind of is like, okay, what what do we kind of project in the next 10 years? And I, I joke with you, I'm like, well, I don't really have a crystal ball. I have a coffee cup and I'll look at my coffee to see what it says. But it says usually, Karen, you need more coffee. But, um, but I do think like what we, we, you know, like I like about what we did is that um, we definitely feel like um, there's an opportunity for us to kind of really kind of as academics project saying, okay, here's kind of what the next steps are. Here's where we're going to go in the future. And I think that's really exciting. 